Hello, everyone in your homes. Uh, my name is Dorothea von Moltke. Uh, I'm one of the owners of Labyrinth Books. And on behalf of Labyrinth and our co-sponsors, we are so glad that you could join us tonight. Um, we are here, of course, for a conversation between Jesse Wegman and Julian Zelizer about Jesse Wegman's new book, Let the People Pick the President, The Case for Abolishing the Electoral College. Uh, Sam Wang, who is professor of neuroscience at Princeton, but who is with us today wearing his hat as uh, director of the Princeton Election Consortium and the Princeton Gerrymandering Project, will take over as host in just a few minutes, and uh, he will also be the one to introduce our speakers. They will talk about the book before Sam then comes back up on screen to moderate questions. And um, we will make sure to leave plenty of time for your questions. I want to be sure that you know how best to ask them. As you maybe saw, I just took the chat down from the sidebar. I'll bring that back up during Q&A. But there is an ask a question button at the bottom middle of your screen, and that's the best place to put those questions. Feel encouraged to just queue those questions up as they occur to you. And if you see something in the, um, in the queue already that interests you as well, there's a little arrow uh, next to each question, and you can upload that. And that will give us then a sense uh, that there's a kind of cumulative interest in a particular topic. Um, so that's that's how that all works. Um, a few more quick things from me. I just want to take a minute to thank our partner in this, as in so many other uh, events that we're doing, the, um, the Princeton Public Library, and also our other co-sponsors. So a quick shout out to uh, the Princeton Gerrymandering Project, to Princeton's Pace Center for Civic Engagement, uh, and Princeton's Public Lecture Series. Uh, thank you to everyone there, Jason especially, uh, for making this conversation happen. One of the really meaningful uh, dimensions of this difficult time has been, I think, the, the continued and maybe even deepening spirit of collaboration among so many groups and people here in Princeton, and that feels lucky. Uh, in fact, I invite you to put two more dates in your calendars uh, for collaborative events. Um, one is on June 18th at six o'clock. Uh, Labyrinth, the library, and the Woodrow Wilson School are, are co-hosting a conversation between Sam Wang, again, and Dave Daly about Daly's uh, new book, a book on um, fighting back against gerrymandering. And then on July 7th, uh, Julian Zelizer will be back uh, to discuss his own book, which will uh, be just caught off the presses that day on July 7th. That book is called Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich, The Fall of a Speaker, and the Rise of the New Republican Party. Uh, he will be in conversation with Sean Valence on the library's Crowdcast site. And to get registration links to those events and all our other events, you can follow either the Labyrinth or Crowdcast uh, on those uh, Crowdcast sites or on our Facebook pages. You can, of course, also sign up for our newsletters on uh, each of our homepages on our, on our websites. And those go out once a week with um, updates on all the events that we are each doing and doing together. So one more housekeeping point, if you want to buy Let the People Pick the President from Labyrinth, and we could use your support during this time, um, it will ship for free to you and be 10% off if you place your order by sending an email uh, to the following email address, which will reappear in the chat also uh, towards the end of this event. So an email to orders.labyrinth at gmail.com with a callback number is one way. Otherwise, you can call us during our phone hours and uh, place your order that way. And the phone number, again, will be in the chat. All of this is also on our homepage. But those phone hours are uh, Tuesday through Saturday, 11 AM to 4 PM. And check our website if you didn't have a pen handy uh, to note any of this down. But now, uh, as this country continues to battle the pandemic, and is also confronting still and again the structural racism, which gives the lie to the promise of equality in America. The fact that at the same time, uh, the question whether our presidential elections can and will be 
conducted in a fair and uh, democratic manner, that this question hangs in the balance sort of boggles the mind. Uh, but we do have to face all threats to this demo democracy, which include the institution of the Electoral College. And with that, I'm going to take myself out of this view and bring up our speaker speakers and hand things over to Sam Wang. So give me just a second um, to do that. Let's see. So yeah, uh, thanks everybody for coming out. It's a beautiful day here in Princeton for those of you who are watching from nearby. And so I really appreciate uh, everyone coming out, even though I can't see you, which is uh, too bad for me. Uh, as Dorotea says, uh, I'm Sam Wong. I'm a professor of neuroscience and also proprietor of the Princeton Election Consortium and director of the Princeton Gerrymandering Project. Uh, and it is my pleasure to be here with you tonight. And uh, I thank Labyrinth Books and the Princeton Gerrymandering Project uh, and the Pace Center for making this possible. It's a funny time to be uh, talking about the Electoral College, at least seemingly, because the election is uh, coming, but it's five months away. We've got a pandemic. We've got a lot of unrest. And I think a lot of people's minds are uh, perhaps not thinking about electoral college reform because that is a long-term reform to our democracy. Uh, but I would say as a fan of democracy, as somebody who uh, wants to preserve and strengthen it, I think that there's not a more important time to be doing this because we have short-term concerns like uh, what's happening to, to men and women uh, across America. And we're seeing the outpouring of um, emotion and sometimes rage uh, about what's happening. Um, for instance, uh, with uh, the late Mr. Floyd in Minneapolis. Uh, but we also have to uh, maintain and preserve our democracy and even strengthen it for the long term. And so I can't think of a better guest than uh, Jesse Wegman, who's joining us tonight. Uh, he has his new book, which I'm gonna show you. This is the new book here. It's a lovely book, Let the People Pick the President, The Case for Abolishing the Electoral College. I see Jesse smiling. He probably doesn't get tired of seeing this book because uh, it's a new book and it's a great book. And I just want to show it to you, all to you. You can buy it through Labyrinth Books. Uh, we'll be providing a link uh, at Labyrinth Books' website, also, um, also at my website at election.princeton.edu. So I think the fundamental driver behind uh, Jesse's book is this feeling that we vote and vote and vote and nothing happens. And I think I think Jesse has really captured that. And let me just talk just very briefly about Jesse and then about Julian. Uh, Jesse is, uh, has a legal background. He has a long uh, back, uh, track record as a, a, a reporter as well. So he graduated from the NYU School of Law where he's currently teaching. He's a member of the New York Times editorial board where he covers legal matters, democracy reform, and the Supreme Court. Um, he's done uh, reporting for uh, NPR for Living on Earth, All Things Considered, and Weekend Edition. He's done a federal clerkship at the U.S. District Court uh, for the Southern District uh, of New York. Is that right, uh, Jesse? Um, and he's been uh, a managing editor of the New York Observer, legal editor at Reuters, a senior editor at the Daily Beast and Newsweek. So he comes from with a long reporting background, and he comes with, a, I think, a keen appreciation of the importance of the Electoral College. And, uh, and I have to say, I enjoyed his book tremendously. Uh, Jesse is going to be uh, interviewed. Uh, there'll be a conversation between uh, him and my colleague, Julian Zelizer, and Julian and I, of course, also co-host the podcast, Politics and Polls. Uh, Julian, professor of history and also uh, public affairs uh, at the Woodrow Wilson School, um, has been among the pioneers in the revival of American political history. He's the Malcolm Stevenson Forbes Class of 1941 Professor of History and Public Affairs at Princeton University. Uh, you may have also seen him on CNN uh, doing political analysis, and uh, you may have heard him on NPR's Here and Now. Um, He's the author and editor of 20 books. He's won multiple prizes. Uh, and uh, coming up on July 7th, he's got his own book, uh, yet another book that is perhaps quite relevant to our troubled times. He's got a new book, Burning Down the House, that Dorotea uh, talked about, which is about Newt Gingrich, the fall of a speaker, and the rise of the new Republican Party, which uh, is a major landmark in today's scene. So, uh, so Julian is going to take it away, and Julian and Jesse will uh, have a conversation, and I will join up with moderated question and answer towards the end. So gentlemen, take it away. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dorothea. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Jesse, for, for being part of this. And thanks to everyone who is watching. I uh, hope everyone is safe and healthy. Uh, and these are difficult times. And I was thinking this was not a question I was going to ask you, but I will. Uh, Sam mentioned, is this a funny time to be speaking? 
about the Electoral College. And I remember when I wrote about the Civil Rights Movement years ago, one of their big issues was cloture reform. They often would speak about how if you didn't change the way the filibuster worked in the Senate, civil rights was never going to happen. And I'm thinking about that with your book. How is Electoral College reform actually related to directly to some of the uh, issues that are at the heart of the protests taking place around the nation? Uh, thanks, Julian, and, and thanks, Sam, and thanks, Dorothea and Labyrinth Books for having me. It's a great question. Uh, obviously, um, from the moment the book has come out, uh, the world that I was expecting to talk about it in was was blown to, to bits. <laughs> and now, once again, we've we've we're entering a new phase of of I think uh, a very serious existential unrest, and uh, and and rightly so. I think these are issues that uh, have come up for decades, again and again, and, and have not been uh, addressed. Um, I'll say two things to your to your question. I'll, I'll answer it in two ways. In one, I think. Um, you know, there, there's an interesting tie-in in my mind to what's actually happening this week on the ground in, in cities and towns across America, which is that so much of the outrage, so much of the anger and the despair that we're seeing expressed is really a, a function of people feeling that they're not being heard, that they're not being listened to, that their voices don't matter to the people in power. And I think that's really the essence of the frustration with the Electoral College as well, is the sense that people in a representative democracy who should be treated as equals, pol political equals, and who should all have an equal voice in choosing their leaders and in helping to um, select people who will craft policies for everybody are ignored. Uh, and, and in that case, it's people all over the country. It's people of all political uh, persuasions. It's people in big states and small states and East Coast and West Coast and heartland. Uh, and, and, and then it's especially um, people like uh, black voters in the South who are uh, right now in, in, this, in this era overwhelmingly democratic. Uh, and, and because most of the Southern states, the deep Southern states have a majority or at least a plurality of white voters, uh, their voices uh, are, are completely erased every four years in the election for the president. So when they go to the ballot box, they're not heard. When they are confronting law enforcement, they're not heard. And I think I think this this theme of um, erasure and of, uh, of of silencing is really crucial, and it really is corrosive to the functioning of a representative democracy. To answer that question from a slightly different angle, you talk about cloture and its and its connection to. Um, uh, 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 to the civil rights movement uh, and to the Civil Rights Act in particular, and it's a you know for people who don't know what cloture is, it's a it's a and it's a it's a mechanism, it's a parliamentary mechanism for stopping for ending a filibuster uh, in the Senate. Uh, the Senate has this 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 interesting rule called the filibuster, which allows one senator to essentially block uh, de uh, debate or or to to hold the floor and and and, and kill off debate on legislation. Uh, and 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 cloture is a way of of ending that. Um, and the reason that it's interesting to me, still even today, obviously that was a that was an issue back in the '60s as the Southern segregationists uh, were were uh, in, you know Strom Thurmond, foremost among them, were were blocking uh, the adoption of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. It was also uh, as Chapter Five of my book details. It was also a, a key element in uh, our last real effort to abolish the Electoral College through a constitutional amendment. Uh, that effort passed the House of Representatives in 1969 overwhelmingly, an abolishment of the Electoral College in favor of the popular vote. And it looked like it had enough uh, energy to get ratified in 38 states to become a, an amendment to the Constitution. Who blocked it? Southern segregationist senators uh, uh, in, in the Senate, uh, so, uh, Strom Thurmond among them. Uh, and there was not, there were not enough votes to invoke cloture. So uh, yes, um, both structurally on the national level, but also in our cities and streets, we have these systems that have continued to operate against large numbers of people and specific groups of people and keep them out of our democracy. And so with the filibuster, that was directly uh, related, certainly by the 20th century, to protecting racial segregation and to protecting uh, the way race relations were handled uh, wasn't the only reason we had a filibuster develop. Uh, it was a tradition of the Senate, but it becomes connected to this. The Electoral College is, is part of our foundation. It's, it's part of our uh, constitutional mechanism. Why do we have it? Why do we have this system that few people totally understand? We accept it. Uh, and obviously a system that causes great frustration. Where did it come from? 
It came, frankly, from exhaustion. Um, the founders uh, adopted it in the very last moments of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787. They had been debating it constantly from the beginning until the end. They debated it on 21 different days. They held 33 separate votes. Uh, they could not decide on how to choose a president for obvious reasons. There had never been a president before. They were just building this republic from the ground up. They had had the Articles of Confederation, which did not include a, a chief executive. And they didn't know what was the proper way to choose the president. Some of them wanted Congress to do it. Some of them wanted state governors to do it. Several of the most influential ones wanted there to be a popular vote, uh, but they could not agree on a method. And by the end, everyone was exhausted. They'd had lots of fights over many other issues and they realized we have to get this document done and out the door to get ratified by the states in order to you know, have a functioning country, right? They're in the middle of the Revolutionary War. Uh, uh, they, can't be, they can't be dithering. So. Uh, at the end of the convention in early September, uh, a few of the delegates go off into a side room and they basically cobble together this system that we now, you know, in, that in large part is what we today call the Electoral College. It, it, was, it was adapted in some very important ways by the 12th Amendment uh, a few decades later. But fundamentally, the, the, the system they designed is the system we live with today. And, uh, you know, the reasons that they did it, um, we, we can point to several of them. There's a lot of misunderstanding or misconceptions about why they did it. Um, certainly slavery is at the center of the story of the, of the, of the Constitutional Convention and the, and the accommodations made to the slave states. And that is a big part of this story. Also just the, the logistics of life in, the, in, in late 18th century America. There was no uh, transportation network. People didn't move far from home. And I think uh, several of the delegates uh, were rightly uh, concerned that people wouldn't know enough about um, national candidates for national office to make an informed decision. But you know, there was so much going on uh, that was so different for them than, than it is for us today in terms of who had, this, who had the right to vote, uh, who, who was considered a citizen, um, how many people lived in the country, how big the country was physically, all of these things, that it's really hard to, to graft any modern understanding of why we have an electoral college onto the, the reason that it was adopted in the first place. And then another part of the book that's really interesting is your discussion of why we have a winner take all system, why that concept became part of our democracy as opposed to something more proportional. Right. How do we get there? And uh, I mean, what was the thinking behind giving yeah. one, one side all the, the, the reward? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Thank you for bringing it up because it really is at the core of what is so distorting about the electoral college's functioning today. And I think this is something that most Americans do not understand. I don't think I even fully grasped it before I started working on this book. And I went to law school, so I should know this stuff. Uh, the winner take all rule. So let, let me just lay this out very quickly. Um, it, for those who aren't clear, when you look at that map every four years, right, and we talk about red states and blue states and which state is red and which state is blue, that is purely a visual artifact of this winner-take-all rule. It is the state winner-take-all rule that all but two states in the country, Nebraska and Maine, use to award their electoral votes. And it means exactly what it sounds like it means, which is a state gives all of its electors to the winner of the statewide vote. Whichever candidate wins the most votes in the state, doesn't matter how many votes they win, doesn't matter how much they win by, whoever wins the most votes in the state gets all the state's electoral votes. That is the winner take all rule. That is the rule that is the most distorting of all. It is, has nothing to do with the constitution. So when we talk about, when you know we have this debate and we quickly jump to, people jump to defending the college and saying, if you destroy the electoral college, you destroy our republic. And other people say, the electoral college must go, abolish the electoral college. And I think nobody quite realizes that what they're talking about is probably the winner take all rule, which has nothing to do with the constitution. The winner take all rule is a state-based rule. State le legislatures enact it themselves and they can, they can knock it out tomorrow if they want to. M Nebraska and Maine adopted their own system, which is based on congressional districts. But the reason that states started adopting this rule, they started doing it right in the first decades of the country's uh, history. I, I think 1796, uh, 1800 were the first years of, of statewide winner take all rules. And they did it because they realized that they would, they would carry a lot more political clout if they could offer all of their electors to one candidate or another. Now, this was not what the framers were thinking about when they created the Electoral College, of course, because they weren't thinking of political parties. Political parties didn't exist 
when the Constitutional Convention happened. They weren't thinking that people would divide into tribes, basically, and work more in interest of their tribe than in the interest of the country as a whole, which is what I think the model of, of president, the only, the only president who's ever fit that model was George Washington. Um, <clears throat> so as soon as you get into a situation where there are political parties, which is at the end of the 18th century, you have suddenly a need to figure out how do we help our party more than the other. So any state that had a majority of, say, Federalists or Democratic Republicans wanted to give as much of their political clout to that to their to their side as they could. So Virginia could say, hey, Democratic Republican candidate, we're going to give you all of our electors if you win the most votes here. Uh, and, and the same with the Federalists. And that's been the that's been the story all through American history is winner take all is about political clout in the states. And it's really it, it also points the way to, I think, a reform, which we can talk about uh, later in this conversation. But the, the, the essence of the point is this is a state based system and states decide for themselves how to award electors. And I think most people don't realize that that's how the Constitution is actually drawn up. So I want to come back to that later um, in some of your discussion of reforms today, that, that relevant point. Uh, the one argument you often hear for the Electoral College is it protects smaller states uh, like the Senate. Um, and, and there's an argument in favor. Is that, uh, and uh, is there any validity to that argument? No, um, is the short answer. <laughs> uh, and I'll tell you why. Um, so small states uh, currently are actually the ones that suffer the most under the Electoral College. And that's because like many big states and like most medium states, they are not battleground states. This gets us back to this discussion of the winner take all rule. The winner take all rule creates this, um, this, this phenomenon of safe states and battleground states, right? So we say the vast majority of states are safe, meaning it's, we know which candidate is gonna win them well in advance. It, it, is, it is of no value to, the, to either party to campaign in those states, to care about what those state citizens want, to think about policies that might appeal to those, those states, because it, whatever they do, it won't matter. Those states are gonna be Republican, they're gonna be Democratic. There are a handful of states every four years, battleground states, where a little bit of campaigning can make a big difference. Because if you shift just a few hundred or a few thousand votes in those states, you move all of that state's electors from one column into the other. We said that happened obviously in 2000 in Florida, where literally 537 votes uh, was the difference between, you know, in an election where more than 6 million Floridians cast ballots, gave all 25 of Florida's electors to George W. Bush and thus the White House and zero to Al Gore, even though, you know, it was essentially a tie. Um, so, you know, when you have battleground states, you realize that the only states that matter to the presidential candidates and therefore to the way they talk about policy, to the way they propose that to create, po you know, political platforms and to the way presidents govern is that is the interest of residents in battleground states and sometimes the interest of particular slices of residents in in battleground regions of battleground states right so the i4 corridor in florida for example um uh or the suburbs of, of ohio uh and so small states uh there's let's say 13 small states um and by small i'm, I'm defining these as states with three or four electoral votes 13 of them exist in the country 12 of them are safe states meaning Democratic, Republican, six are Democratic, six are Republican. There's only one small state that uh, is, is, is considered a battleground and that's New Hampshire. New Hampshire in 2016 got more attention from the two candidates uh, than all the other 12 small states combined. So the small states suffer from the same dilemma that all the other states suffer from except for maybe a half dozen battleground states, which is they don't matter to the outcome of the election. You know, you made your point about the Senate there is this, there is a factor in which the Senate, you know, because every state gets two electors for their senators, that 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 imbalance, the distortion that the states, the smaller states get from the Senate does carry over into the Electoral College, but it's so overwhelmed by this winner take all rule that it is effectively uh, uh, nullified. And then the other remarkable thing about the Electoral College is that despite the problems you really point out very well in this book, uh, and moments like the 60s and 70s when it came up and almost was reformed, it often is very durable. Um, it, it's been a very durable part of our democratic institutions. And I'm curious, and even after 2000, for example, or after mm -hmm. like 2016, you hear talks 
reporters will ask you, is it going to be reformed? And you can pretty much give a safe answer with a no. Uh, why is that? I mean, is it simply we're used to it and so it's not a top issue? Or is there something about how it entrenched itself uh, that makes it hard to undo? Or does it have defenders uh, who are that powerful that this is not going to be an issue? The number of defenders of the Electoral College on principled grounds is minuscule. I, you know, I could I could put them in this room with me. Um, the vast majority of defenders of the Electoral College of from all parties throughout American history are defending it on the grounds that they believe that it helps their party, its advantages their party politically. I can I want to give you an example of this because it's an incredible part of the story, I think, and it reminds us that this is not democratic sour grapes. This is an issue that has been wrangling, rankling both parties throughout American history. And, uh, you know, um, I just think it, we can't forget that because it's happened twice in the last 20 years and it's, and it's hurt the Democrats both times. So it looks like this reform effort is a democratic one. There have been more than 700 attempts in Congress to reform or abolish the Electoral College since the founding. Right? That's more than by far than for any other part of the Constitution. People have hated this thing from the start. They knew that it was bad. James Madison in the early 1820s tried to introduce a constitutional amendment to ban winner take all because he knew he could see how distorting it was. He said this in a letter and he and, and he, he failed because for this very reason, which is that political parties like their power and they hold on to their power when they can get it. But I just want to read you a, a, just a very a short passage here. This is from a floor speech in the House of Representatives in 1951 by uh, Ed Gossett, who was a Texas representative. And he's speaking to an interesting phenomenon in the middle of the 20th century, which is that at that time, New York State was the biggest swing state in the country. We don't think about New York as a swing state today, right? We think about it as an obviously democratic led state. Uh, and it's gonna go blue every time, even though there are millions of Republicans in New York. Uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, New York was a big swing state and the people who swung New York one way or the other were racial and ethnic minorities in the big cities, black voters, Jewish voters. Um, and that was an incredible leverage point that they had. And so black voters and Jewish voters were among some of the most um, strident defenders of the electoral college at that time, precisely because they knew it helped them. They, they who would not want that power, right? They're basically hold the presidency in their hands. Uh, you know, there's some people who believe that Lyndon Johnson got behind the Civil Rights Act in last, in part because he knew that he needed those votes <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the Northern cities. So I'm just gonna read you, this is, this is a complaint from a white uh, conservative in Texas, a, a conservative uh, uh, representative in the house. And this is what he said about this, this um, state of affairs at the time. Now, please understand, he said, I have no objection to the Negro in Harlem voting and to his vote being counted, but I do resent the fact that both parties will spend a hundred times as much money to get his vote and that his vote is worth a hundred times as much in the scale of national politics as is the vote of a white man in Texas. And then at the end, he says, is it fair? Is it honest? Is it democratic? Is it to the best interest of anyone, in fact, to place such a premium on a few thousand labor votes or Italian votes or Irish votes or Negro votes or Jewish votes or Polish votes or communist votes or big city machine votes simply because they happen to be located in two or three large industrial pivotal states? That is a complaint that you would hear word for word today from liberals about voters in Ohio or Wisconsin or Florida, right? It's the exact same complaint. We've been hearing it throughout American history. So to answer your question in a very long-winded way, yes, it has always been at, go, we've always been going against the wind here to try to change it because th this effort is fundamentally one that is about the long-term health of a democratic society and not about short-term interests uh, of either party. And the, uh, reform effort you mentioned before in the 60s and 70s, uh, led by uh, Birch by Senator from Indiana, was one of the key players, I believe. Yes. Uh, can you just tell, uh, just briefly, that? Yeah. Tell people what happened. I don't think people know about that episode in America. It's amazing. It's gone down the American memory hole. And yet it was front page news throughout the late 1960s. Obviously, so much else is happening then. But Birch by almost single handedly, 
got America to adopt <laughs> this amendment. Birch Bayh, by the way, is responsible for the 25th Amendment, which is the Presidential Disability Amendment, uh, which we've been talking about a lot these days for different reasons, uh, which was uh, uh, ratified in the wake of President Kennedy's assassination, and also uh, the 26th Amendment, which is the, the uh, lowering the voting age. Uh, and he would have been responsible for the ERA if we had passed that as well. So he was a one-man amendment machine. He realized early on in his, he was actually a defender of the Electoral College as it functioned at the time at first. And after holding Senate hearings, he realized, no, I'm wrong. The Electoral College actually works to the detriment of representative democracy. And the only solution is a national popular vote. He gives this impassioned speech on the floor of the Senate in 1966, makes the best case that I think I've ever heard for why we need a popular vote. And he, and he, and he does so by tying it into the longer story of democratization in America. He links it to both the, the, the words of our Declaration of Independence in which we, we assert uh, the truth of universal human equality, right? We have never actually in practice lived that truth, but we assert it in, in 1776. Um, and, uh, and so then you have, um, you know, the removal of property qualifications, which allows uh, non-proper, you know, you know, poorer white men to vote. You have this, the Civil War and the Reconstruction Amendments, which make black uh, people citizens and allow them to vote. You have women's suffrage in the 1920s. You have uh, direct voting for senators, which you didn't used to have. All of these changes in American history are in the direction of a greater democracy, more inclusiveness, more egalitarian systems of government. And so Birch Bay says, this is part of that evolution. And he is saying this in the wake of the Civil Rights Act, in the wake of the Voting Rights Act, and in the wake of the one person, one vote uh, revolution at the Supreme Court, which really completely transformed American democracy on its own. So this whole, there was a new conception of who was included in our democracy. Again, I think we're at this moment today, and that's what we're seeing on the streets of America today, is a fight over who is included, who has a voice in American democracy. And I think when we have those debates, as heated as they are right now, as heated as they were in the late 1960s, it is really a moment for us to latch on and make the kinds of changes that we know need to be made and can be made. So the Birch Bay story is just a fascinating effort. By the end of the 1960s, more than 80% of Americans in polls said they wanted a popular vote for president. It's still, the number is still in the 60s and 70s. It's never dropped below a majority and usually a, a healthy majority, including Republicans. Uh, but right in the late 1960s, Republicans, Democrats, everyone was basically on board. Richard Nixon as president, supported it. George H.W. Bush supported it. Bob Dole supported it. You know, everybody is behind it. It's the Southern segregationists to kill it in the Senate in 1970, and we've never come that, that close since. Perhaps since Nixon supported it, President Trump will as well. Um, <laughs> well, oh, can I, can I, can I interrupt you? Sorry. Yeah. The, the inside, in, in the inside yeah. jacket of my book, uh, he does support it, in fact. Donald Trump has said this many times. The Electoral College is a disaster for a democracy. Donald Trump said that in 2012 in a tweet. Why did he say it? Because it looked like to him briefly that the polls were suggesting Mitt Romney was going to win the popular vote and lose the Electoral College to Barack Obama. His candidate was going to win more votes, lose the Electoral College. That is a fundamental uh, a violation of majority rule and political equality that I think everybody feels in their heart, no matter their political uh, uh, ideology. Donald Trump expressed it uh, bluntly, as he is, you know, want to do. And I, I really think we can't uh, look past that. I think everybody gets in their gut how unfair it is when their candidate wins more votes and doesn't become the leader. Yeah, I, I'm almost out of my time, but I want to ask one question, but I'll preface it by telling everyone listening, one of the great parts of this book is how you go through all the myths mm. about the Electoral College and, and burst those myths, uh, which is incredibly helpful because since this is an issue we don't know a lot about many people, uh, it's nice to have some foundation for analyzing these arguments when they come out. But right now there is a reform effort and it's not led by one senator. Uh, it seems a little broader, and uh, it's called the National Popular Vote Compact, and I assume this book will really speak to that movement. Can you tell us a little bit about what's been going on and what they're achieving? Sure. This is an idea that is tied to something we talked about at the beginning, which is this that states have total control over how to award their electors. The Supreme Court has made this uh, completely clear for more than 100 years. This is a state decision. It is not a federal decision. It is not in the Constitution. 
The National Popular Vote Interstate Compact is an agreement among states. It's a, it's a mouthful, but it's really fundamentally just a contract that several states enter into. States do this all the time for all kinds of different issues. The states that join this compact are agreeing to award all of their electors, not to the winner of their state's vote, but to the winner of the national popular vote, to the vote in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. There are now 15 states that have joined this compact as well as DC, and they equal a total of 196 electors. So um, what they need to do and what this compact requires in order to take effect is they need to reach a majority of electoral votes. 270. If you get 270 electoral votes, you win the presidency. So when you put those two things together, giving your electors to the winner of the popular vote and getting to 270, you see what the logic of the compact is, which is the candidate who wins the most votes in the country automatically becomes the president. All votes are counted. All votes are equal. All votes matter. It is just a way of using the Electoral College as it's designed in the Constitution to, to get to a popular vote and to force candidates from Democratic and Republican parties to pay attention to everybody rather than just voters in a small handful of arbitrary swing states. And my final question comes back to the first question I asked you. Do you think uh, groups of uh, different uh, political movements today, and, and not simply Black Lives Matters, but other groups, the environmental movement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do they see the connection? Do they talk enough about the connection between this process and the issues that they are fighting for? That's what the civil rights movement was very good at. They made the filibuster something dramatic and, and deadly and devastating. Uh, do groups do that anymore? Or is this issue kind of been segmented even though a lot of people don't like the process? That's a great question. And I, I'm not sure that I have a, a, a great answer for it. Here's what I, here's, here's my gut instinct. In 2000, this happened. It was the first time in anyone in, in, in living memory that it had happened. It had been 112 years since it had happened before uh, that, that the Electoral College had gone against the popular vote. As an issue, it very quickly disappeared for a few reasons that we that we can identify pretty easily. One is just the sheer chaos around the recount in Florida. Now, obviously that whole recount had to do with the Electoral College and the winner take all rule, but people weren't thinking about it really that way. It was really about the Supreme Court, the 5-4 vote, Bush v. Gore. And then obviously nine months later, terrorists attack the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and the world you know, descends into war. America gets into a war that we're still in 20 years later. Um, the Electoral College very quickly drifted to the background. And, and I think it might have stayed there, but for 2016. This time it happened again, and it didn't just happen for anybody, it happened for Donald Trump. And I think so many people, Republicans as well as Democrats, were so concerned about Donald Trump as a candidate, as a person, as a character. And I think the fact that he not only won, but won in this way that really brought to light the deep and persistent inequities in the design of our constitutional system. And not just that, but inequities that were built around racism and racial subjugation, which is something he ran on fundamentally. You know, I think that was just too much for people. So I really think the Electoral College as a political, as a social issue has stayed much more in um, the public eye today uh, than, uh, than it did in 2000. And I think that's a good thing. I hope that people see it as tied in, in, in that interwoven into these other, maybe more um, urgent, more visceral issues like police brutality, because I do think fundamentally at the end of the day, we can't solve any of these problems unless everybody has an equal voice in choosing the leaders who, who fix them. You know, if, if it's only certain people who always have an outsized voice, we are never going to get to a, a true representative democracy. And that's what I think, that's the only way America survives. Well, I'm going to turn it back to Sam now, uh, but let me just say this is a really terrific, terrific and important book, and I hope a lot of people pick it up, read it, and, uh, and are more informed in the battles ahead. Thanks. All right. That was really great. Uh, you guys uh, really stirred up a lot of questions. Uh, there are a lot of things in the chat here that, uh, that can come up. Uh, Although I'm, I'm going to say that, Jesse, I want to have at you just a little bit because I'm, I'm fascinated by this uh, interplay that you and Julian have had. Um, one thing I think that maybe uh, might get emphasized is maybe you can talk about it a little bit is that these close elections are the ones where the electoral vote and the popular vote don't match. And part of what's going on as you talk about Bush v. Gore and about Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton and so on, 
Um, those are pretty recent events. And it strikes me uh, when one looks at the historical record, the last time we had a series of really close elections was back uh, during the Gilded Age. And Julian, of course, knows I, I have an obsession with the Gilded Age, um, at least in this regard. So it seems like it's actually a pretty recent event. And that creates this tense situation in which we're now realizing what a problem is while we're in the middle of the problem. And so I, I wonder if it was it would have been easier to fix this while Birch Bay was in the mix because there weren't <laughs> such close elections at that time, mostly. It's, a, it's such a great point, this point that 2000 and 2016 are separated by 16 years. We've had five elections in American history where the electoral college vote and the popular vote have actually split. Numbers two and three, that we're, we've just had four and five. Two and three were, were roughly similarly separated. They were 1876 and 1888. And as I think you've pointed out, Sam, uh, such an important point is that both of these eras today and back then in the late 19th century are characterized by intense political polarization, drastic economic inequality, and extremely close elections. And as you say, when elections aren't close, people don't care so much about the mechanics of our voting and, and don't care so much, right? When Eisenhower is winning everywhere or when Ronald Reagan is winning 49 of 50 states, it doesn't really matter. It's pretty clear what the what the a majority of Americans want. When you have these extremely close elections, uh, I do think you're really facing a totally different story and you're looking at you know this sort of the, that artificial red blue divide which completely masks the reality of American life, which is, you know, the cover of the book is purple, right? All states are purple. Millions of Republicans live in California. Millions of Democrats live in Texas. Millions of us live everywhere. Every candidate for a major political party gets lots of votes all over the country. So I really think when when the votes when the when the national vote is is close and it was in 2000, it was not really in 2016. I think uh, th three million is a pretty sizable win. Um, uh, yeah, cut off. Um, it, you you really are uh, as you as you've talked about Sam I think really looking at the specifics of the way we choose the president and I think that's when we we face this this question of are we doing it in a way that's actually fair equitable and democratic so I'm going to make one very nerdy point and then uh, and then spin it over to uh, to some questions there's actually quite a lot of questions and uh, Julian is uh, uh, going to rejoin us. He seems to be back now. So I'm just going to make a super nerdy point. Julian has talked about the National Popular Vote Compact, this agreement in which states would agree to give all their electors to the winner of the National Popular Vote. Um, it strikes me it might not be quite a ripe time for that because everything is so bitterly contested and has become partisan. But I am going to say something. I was running numbers and I discovered something which is that if California and Texas, just two states, made the deal to give all their electors to the national popular vote winner, that by itself would actually get rid of most of the problem. Sim, just that single two-state deal. It, huh? It's, huh? Not, huh? it's not nerdy. It's been, it's been discussed, this, almost that exact oh, really? idea. You know, yes, oh, New, oh, Yex, okay. New Yexus. No, no, listen, it's called New Yexus. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. New Yexus? Oh, yeah, God. New Yexus. Chuck Schumer, more. Chuck Schumer in the early 90s, Chuck Schumer oh, talked about this idea of making uh, a basically New York and Texas, which at that time had the exact same number of electoral votes and virtually the same population, and were clearly one was Democratic and one was Republican, um, joining together and giving all of their electors as a, as a unit to whichever candidate won the most votes in those two states. That was going to have the same effect as a national popular vote compact would today, and as you say, uh, that would, you know, effectively what what you're yeah. describing. So that that one agreement all by itself, maybe New York, I haven't run those numbers, but certainly California, Texas, the uh, yeah. uh, a, a, a Cal Tex Tex Cal agreement, uh, a Texas California compact would actually have uh, made the popular vote winner in 2000 and in 2016 the the president. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. there is that. Um, but I think this gets us to now questions of partisanship, because I think that one thing that um, that perhaps, I think your book, um, as it gives the long arc, it's not always about partisanship, but today it's about partisanship. Yes. And I, I want to start with a question from uh, one of uh, our viewers, Michael, Michael Timmons. He wants to know, how do we get rid of the Electoral College when one party has benefited from its existence? And I wonder if uh, you could talk about that a little bit. So this is an interesting part of the story. Um, 
Yes, in 2016, one party definitely benefited. That was the Republican Party. I think we shouldn't overplay that. For one thing, uh, in 2004, we came very close to uh, the Electoral College benefiting the other party. Uh, George okay. W. Bush won the popular vote nationwide by 3 million votes, the same number that Hillary Clinton beat Donald Trump by. And yet, if you had uh, 60,000 votes difference in, in Ohio, just 60,000 votes, which is nothing uh, compared to the state of Ohio and certainly not compared to the nation, uh, John Kerry would have been president. So in that scenario, we would have had both parties benefit from the Electoral College in a four year span. We wouldn't have, I wouldn't have written this book. We wouldn't be talking about this today. The Electoral College would have been um, a history in 2005. Um, also, I think it's really important to remember, here's another part of the story. And I, 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 I talked about this when I spoke to Julian about um, black uh, uh, voters and Jewish voters in the big cities in the North having outsized sway in the middle of the 20th century. Some of those voters, the NAACP actually joined, joined forces with the Southern segregationists to protect the Electoral College against this effort that Birch because Hyatt they that because, because they actually did benefit, right? Both of them benefited from the college's existence. So I just don't think it's, it's, it's not as simple as a, a story as to say the Republicans always benefit. In fact, it, you don't know before any election whether the Electoral College is going to give a bonus to one side or the other. In Barack Obama's uh, two election, in the elections that he won, it has actually leaned slightly Democratic. So it, it goes back and forth. It depends on a lot of factors. I do agree with the, with the questioner's uh, point, which is that as a matter of perception, it absolutely seems to be a Republican uh, benefit these days, and it probably will have a Republican lean in 2020. I think it's just all I can do to remind people that this is not a static state, but that it's actually always shifting, it, I, I will do, because I really think that's an important part of selling this, um, you know, the compact to the states, which is to say, everybody has a stake in changing the way we choose the president so that everybody is ensured to be included. But it might be that because elections are so close right now, and because enough people think it helps the Republicans, yeah. it's going to have that partisan valence. And I mean, I you know, my own take, uh, without raining on the parade too much, is that we may have to get away from this knife edge balance a little bit in order to get people to think a little bit more clearly about it. It was, yeah, in the, in, in the late 1960s, it had been 80 years since the Electoral College had gone against the popular vote. So nobody living essentially had experienced it. So yes, it, it, we may have gotten that close because people didn't perceive it then as a partisan issue. But I really think it's, it's there's a lot of conservatives involved in this compact effort and a lot of conservative lawmakers around the country have signed onto it. Right now, they won't say so because of this, the circumstances we're in. But, you know, there were more than 150 conservative lawmakers in states around the country who were sponsors of legislation to adopt this uh, compact. Let me um, let me now go to a lightning round of uh, questions. A, a number of uh, viewers uh, and listeners have uh, solutions that and fixes that they're curious about. And I'm just going to go through them and we're going to just do a snapshot of like what would happen if they were attempted. Yeah. Uh, Jenny, Jenny Ludmer wants to know, how would a state go about abolishing the winner-take-all rule? Could it happen, and how? Sure, uh, it's 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 literally a state law. They can change it tomorrow if they want to. Uh, the so, for example, Nebraska and Maine, uh, Nebraska and Maine, which now use a different system than winner-take-all, they give uh, their two Senate-based electors to the winner of the statewide vote, and then they give the rest of their electors to the uh, to whoever wins each congressional district. Um, they just did that by a state law. And then, and in fact, Nebraska did it because they were feeling left out. Nebraska is a, is a quintessential state where people would say, oh, the Nebraskas of the world will be forgotten about in the electoral, you know, if we get rid of the electoral college. No, the opposite is true. Nebraska is forgotten about today because it was a reliably red state. And by that, I just mean there were more Republicans voting there than Democrats. And so they changed their system to the system they have today. That it was just state lawmakers just changed the law and then the governor signed it. Um, in the, I think 1992, and uh, that's what the system they use today. And in fact, Barack Obama uh, peeled off uh, one of uh, the one of Nebraska's uh, electoral votes in 2008. So they did become slightly more competitive. That's what I think all states should care about. So the issue here is that it's done state by state, and so yes. one couldn't. So one would have to do it one at a time. I'm going to nerd out once again and say that uh, I have a law article coming out pretty soon with Jacob Cantor about the uh, national popular vote, and and we point out 
uh, some work that Jonathan Servas and Bernie Groffman have done. These are political scientists. And they point out that assigning electors by congressional district the way that Maine and Nebraska do, if everyone did it that way, there'd be more mismatches between the national vote yeah. and the popular vote and, the, and or the electoral vote and the popular vote. So this right. is just, it bent my mind. Because then partisan gerrymandering would be a part of the presidential right. election, which it isn't today. Right. Yeah. Which leads us now to a, a question from, uh, this is good. This is uh, David Daly, who's going to be joining us at Labyrinth <laughs> another time. David Daly has a question, or at least somebody who's logged on as David Daly. Uh, but it sure sounds like him. And I'm just going to read out the whole question because it just sounds like Dave. Uh, he says, hello, friends. One nightmare scenario for me this fall is that state legislatures in gerrymandered states, Michigan, North Carolina, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Florida, find a way to appoint Republican electors to the Electoral College, either because the pandemic creates any number of complications or because they simply decide to exercise the constitutional power that they have. Can state legislatures do this? What would yeah. happen in Pennsylvania or Wisconsin if a Republican legislature tried to do this and a Democratic voter attempted a veto? How would the Supreme Court this then is, handle that, oh, Supreme Court scholar? This is a difficult question. This is keeping uh, ele election law scholars up at night. Um, I, I talk to them about it all the time. They are really concerned about it. Um, I'll try to answer this as quickly as possible because there's a lot of things going on here. First of all, as a basic matter, states can change, states can award their electors, uh, can choose their electors however they like. They don't have to let you vote at all. We have no constitutional right to play any role at all in electing the president. This is another part of the constitution the Electoral College people don't understand is that state lawmakers can just award the electors at their leisure. They don't need to include us in our, in our vote. Once states have chosen the popular vote as the means of electing, of, 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 of deciding how their electors are awarded, they can't then, after the fact, go back and change it. So if on election day, they don't like what their voters did, state lawmakers can't say, oh, now we're changing it. The, what, the rules that were in place on election day hold, and that's under federal law. However, there is a complicating factor, which is there is an, there's a, a provision in the federal law which says if a state is unable to, to ascertain what the popular vote was, then there is a it's sort of what appears to be an off-ramp for lawmakers to step in and play some role. It is not exactly clear to me whether they would have the power to essentially ignore the results oh, of the popular God. vote or, or possibly whether you might see a state send two different slates of electors to the state capitol, uh, I'm sorry, to, to Washington, uh, one of them that is uh, signed by the Secretary of State, one by the governor, one by the legislature. I mean, this has happened in the past. It has created a real headache. Um, and I can't answer it. I can't answer it with perfect, uh, you know, uh, prescience because I, I'm actually, I, I have to say, maybe I'm being naive here. I don't, I'm not too worried that this is going to happen. I think the far greater fear for me, I think we're actually going to get an accurate vote count uh, in all the states because I have a lot more faith in Republican uh, uh, elections officials than I do in Republican uh, um, you know, leaders in Congress. But I do think that the real fear for me is that Donald Trump uh, delegitimizes the results if he loses. Um, and that I, I think there's no question that that will happen. And that to me is a much greater threat to the outcome of the election and to the peaceful transfer of power than whether this state, this swing state or that swing state might have a contested uh, electoral vote outcome. In that respect, I think the greatest stability or the least destabilization to our republic will probably come if the election is not close. And if the election is not close, then that, that cuts out the legs from any kind of challenge to the Electoral College after November. So, um, so I just wanted to, again, uh, geek out a little bit. One thing I'll notice about Dave Daly's question is that of all the states that he lists, uh, the only one that has single party control over the laws is Florida. And so uh, luckily elections never come down to Florida. <laughs> uh, but in any event, um, but Florida is the one state where that can happen. The other thing is I'm just gonna point out something kind of a peculiarity, which, which is in some sense, and enables our conversation in the first place, which is the winner take all rule almost always gives the presidency to the winner of the national popular vote. And it just so happens that when you work through the math and you look at how people distribute themselves around the country, it is usually the case, like, you know, nine out of 10, which is okay. Nine out of 10 times the national popular vote winner becomes the winner of the electoral college. So at some level, um, when Jefferson, as you write in your book, when Jefferson advocated for the winner take all rule, uh, he sort of did us a favor 
and it was a bug fix that almost worked. That would be my take on it. Let me say two things about that. First of all, yes, Jefferson uh, urged his uh, fellow Virginians to adopt the winner take all rule. He said it would be folly not to do it when other states are doing it. And he was right about that. I will point out that 16 years later, uh, he was writing a private letter to a friend advocating for a popular vote for president. Um, but the other point is, I think to, to your uh, observation that yes, nine out of 10 times the popular vote in the electoral college lineup is, it doesn't matter. Even when that happens, the same corrosive and distortive effect of the Electoral College is playing out, which is that the candidates only care about the voters in the swing yeah, state. They, sure, they don't about, go to California, they don't no, go I, to Wyoming, they don't go I, to Idaho, they don't go to Montana. I, I want to emphasize that point. Places. Look, but let me emphasize that point because like the most visceral violation to all of us is the vi violation of majority rule. This idea that the winner doesn't become president. Donald Trump tweets, the electoral college is a disaster for democracy, right? That's that violation of majority rule. But the more insidious violation is happening every four years, whether or not that split happens. And that is this, this focus uh, on a few thousand or a few tens of thousands of voters to the exclusion of everyone else in America. 140 million people cast ballots, 140 million. And you know what? 77,000 people in effect decided the outcome of the 2016 election. 537 people decided it in 2000. This is not a, this is not a sustainable path for a representative democracy based on political equality to follow. Okay. Listen, um, I'm under some time pressure here. Julian reminds me that uh, that we're a little short of time. I, I want to try to get in two questions. We're going to try to be real quick. And All, right. All right. I'll First is, uh, one commenter says, what about the five U.S. territories who have no right to vote for electors? Is there any way to give the franchise to those three and a half million people? Uh, like in, in Puerto Rico and yeah. I, yeah, I, exactly. That kind of thing. I, I mean, it's a great question. And if we went to a popular vote, they do vote for president. Their votes just don't get okay. translated into electoral votes. So uh, I would... Constitutional or it would, yeah, I, I, I think that if you had, because you, yeah, it would, it would need to be a constitutional amendment. Okay. I don't, they wouldn't be, co they wouldn't be counted under the compact because that only counts electors. All right. And then the last question, oh, by the way, Dave Daly has texted me and says the constitution gives the power to pick electors to the legislature. And so the governor actually doesn't get to say, whoa, oh my gosh. Okay. So Dave Daly just texted me that. <laughs> well, this is like okay. scary. I'll, right. I'll, I'll talk about that with Dave later. Yeah. Okay. You do that. Okay. So That's last question. Yeah, last question. Uh, uh, Kieran Williams wants to know, if we move to a direct popular vote, would the cost of campaigning go up would it, to pay for ads, reach more people? Would it, running for the presidency become prohibitively expensive without public finance or campaign finance reform? Look, I'm all in favor of campaign finance reform. I don't think a popular vote is the thing that's going to uh, jack up the price of campaigning. Uh, you know, campaigns raise as much money as they can and then they spend it. That's what they do. It's not It's not that it costs more money. They're just going to have to reallocate the money that they get to uh, go through all 50 states rather than just steer them out of six states or eight states uh, that are, that are you know, battleground states. I really think, you know, chapter nine in my book, the last chapter was a really fun one to write. And this was one where I spoke to uh, campaign managers and field directors of both par political parties for presidential campaigns going back 20, 25 years. And I asked them all this question is, how would you run a national popular vote campaign differently than you were running the campaign you did to win the electoral college? They all, almost to a person said, I would prefer a popular vote campaign because it would be more representative. It, yeah, right. Imagining a national popular vote. Thank you. Um, and I think that's a really fun chapter because you really get into the guts of how campaigning happens on the ground now in presidential elections. There's a lot you'll learn in that. I would get into it now if we had the time, but there's a lot of interesting revelations in that chapter about how campaigns think about winning votes. And I really think it's it's valuable. Uh, it's a valuable perspective to have in 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 accordance with all the other historical uh, storytelling I do in the book. Well, I think unfortunately that's uh, that's the time that we have. Thank you so much, Jesse. I really encourage everyone to get this book uh, from Labyrinth Books if you can. Uh, and uh, and I thank our uh, our interlocutor, Julian Zelazer. Julian, we uh, we did it again this time yes. through Crowdcast. Thank you both so much. It's really great. Yeah, really and can I just can I just join you also in a yes. word of thanks and um, uh, say that unfortunately there there are a bunch of more questions in the queue, interesting questions. 
But uh, I too want to invite you to take them to the book because it's a really lucidly written book with a forceful argument. Um, so I invite you to do that. This has been such a fascinating conversation. Uh, I think you can, we can all sort of pick our angle of worry about uh, November. Um, and there is part of this conversation that, that makes us feel that there are fixes that are conceivable. Uh, I've been fascinated to have Dave Daly in the wings kind of um, putting the kibosh on those again. It's like, it's like having Marshall McLuhan come out from behind a pillar. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, but it serves for me as a just reminder to, to, to remind all of you uh, that Dave Daly is going to be in conversation uh, with Sam Wang on, on June 18th about his own book, um, which is actually a, a, a story of um, the ways in which we can do something about that other uh, sort of companion problem to the electoral college in the sense that it's also a structural problem in our democracy, which is gerrymandering. Um, so I invite you to to uh, to come back for that. And then, of course, on July 7th, also to come back and hear about Julian uh, Zelizer's new book. So um, we hope to see you again. There's so much that's competing for our attention that requires our engagement uh, in these days. And and I'm, I'm glad that uh, so many of you um, felt that this conversation tonight is among those things. Uh, my thanks to the three of you. Uh, it always feels very odd just to sign off. There's this moment of nothing that we all return to. I would much rather be pouring everyone a glass of wine as we is our habit at Labyrinth. I look forward to doing that again Excellent. when the time is right for that. Um, meanwhile, uh, pour your own drinks be well um stay safe take care bye everybody thanks so much bye everybody <laughs>